Well, Thank welcome. You. It is uh, really a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank Jim and his crew for the wonderful uh, energy they put uh, into this whole process. We had hoped to do it uh, earlier in the year, eyeball to eyeball, but here we are kind of eyeball to eyeball again. And I want to thank uh, Kathleen Thorne and Library U for uh, uh, agreeing to help us get the word out and be a another sponsor of, of this, what I think is a very import, important uh, effort to uh, help people do better with their investments. And so today is kind of a, of a history lesson of sorts, but I want to use this information from the past and the present to give some sense to people what the future might look like uh, as as investors. So uh, let me just uh, all right now, Jim. You know, oh, there I got it right there. All right. First of all, the reason I think this information is important. I think there are a lot of a lot of reasons why people do not get the return they should. It doesn't mean that they fail. It simply means that they could have, without doing much else, make a better rate of return, have more to live on in retirement, have more to give away, to give away to causes like the Community Foundation or to their family. And with small changes, that big differences can come over time. And I do believe that if we can create realistic expectations about our investments, that we will be a better investor. There is a history of people throwing in the towel during bear markets, oftentimes right at the end of a bear market before it takes off. There are still people waiting to figure out how to get in the market since they bailed out in 2008. And a lot of that is because they didn't have realistic expectations or they were chasing fad investments. So many people did that in the late 90s and, the, and then were, were crucified in the 2000 through 2002 bear market. And it wasn't necessary if they understood the history. And the bottom line is, I think you will, in fact, make more money and take less risk. And I think if it uh, doesn't require you to spend day and night focusing on this, if it just means some fairly simple changes to a portfolio, that that is certainly worth the effort. Now, I see investing as this 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 circle of information and, and and within this circle is everything we could know about investing everything that we would know about the past everything we know about the present and we would even know as a part of that knowledge what a whole bunch of people think about the future so this is a lot for people to try to wrestle with and what typically we do is we pick on a handful of things that we're comfortable understanding and that is the basis of kind of the guide to what we do for the future. But I want to break this, this pie graph up into several pieces, five different pieces. The first piece represents what we know we know about investing. And most of the people who are here on this presentation, you do know a lot about investing. And if left with a piece of paper and pencil, you could probably write for an hour the things you know about investing. That that we know, obviously, is going to drive us to whatever decisions that we make. And by the, by the way, when I say we know, I also should say that we know and we trust. But then there's another piece of that pie. What we know, we don't know. And the thing that's so difficult about this process is because we know exactly what we should have done in the past because we have 
the history to prove it. I'm going to show some of, of that today. And it's information that I trust is meaningful, but oftentimes what we know about the past may not be very meaningful, but we do know that we don't know the future. But we as investors have to deal with that as best we can. And then there's a piece of pie that represents what we don't know, we don't know. And we have no idea how big, is that a little piece of pie? Is that a big piece of pie? Well, because we don't know, we don't know it. We have no way to quantify what that is. But I can tell you that a lot of what leads to the final result of what we have in our investment account, in our bank account, et cetera, comes from luck. I mean, just plain being at the right place at the right time. So that is an important piece. And then there's what we know we know, but we are wrong. And those would be the myths of investing. There are so many. I'm working on a list. I am up to over 200 different myths, things that people believe, but there is no evidence that it is in fact the way it is. There are a lot of people who truly believe that the investing in the stock market is just a big gamble. You just might as well go to Las Vegas as put money in the market. There are a lot of people who believe you got to have money to make money. You can't just have a little bit of money. No, you need to have a lot of money and then you can make some real money. Well, there are a lot of myths that hold us back from getting what in some sense might be what we should have as ours. And then there's a part that kind of makes me sad when I'm talking to somebody and I figure out they really know a lot of things about how to be a successful investor, or let's say a more successful investor, but they just don't do anything about it. I, I have basically been on that, uh, uh, that roller coaster or that, <laughs> that treadmill <laughs> with my dieting. I mean, there are things that I know I should and shouldn't be doing, but I uh, got it. I, I do the wrong things. And what I want to do is I, along with you, I want to focus on making sure that, hang on just one sec, ah, there we go. Making sure that one, I want to improve the, I want to expand what you know you know. I want to show you some things about the history of investing that when you know that, if you trust it, that you could then do something about it, and hopefully, maybe I'll say something that will actually motivate you to do it. I am no longer an investment advisor. I don't take that responsibility, but I hope that I can encourage you to do the right thing. And by the way, I know the right thing from the past. I can't tell you about the future in a sense any, but any better than anybody else. So there are limits for all of us. But what is successful investing? What, what is it? How do you do it? What does it represent? Well, most of successful investing is about managing risk. When you talk to people, what they want to know oftentimes is, well, what do you think the market's going to do? Think it's going to be a good year in the market, a bad year in the market? Think that we're going to go down further? They're normally questions about performance. When in fact, we could do little to, 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 to control that. On the other hand, when you look at how to manage money successfully for the long term, there are a whole bunch of steps you can take that you actually have control of. How much you put in, how much you take out, how much in equities, how much in fixed income, the expenses that you pay, the trading that you do, whether you're a buy and holder or a market timer, all of those things are under your control. But so often, again, the focus is on the return out of your control. And I don't think that you should ever take a risk you don't understand. Because there is this optimistic aspect of investing. 
that when we're in the process, we're focusing more on the upside than we are the downside. And I really believe that we as investors should understand not only what the potential return is, but maybe what the return has been in the past, that might be a good thing to know, but maybe more importantly is what did the bad times look like? There were so many people who got sucker punched by the bull market, the technology market in the late 90s. For five years, the S&P 500, 95 to 99, compounded at over 28% a year. And when those people were surveyed and asked, what do you think the next decade will bring? The responses were somewhere between 20 and 30%. Where did that come from? Well, because they had just been through that for five years. But if they had looked back 50 years, would they have come to that conclusion? I suspect not. And that's because they didn't really understand the nature of the risk they were taking. And I also believe you should never take a risk that doesn't pay a premium. There are lots of investments that are risky, and historically the premiums are very small, and yet the risk is very high. And that doesn't make any sense. In theory, if we take more risk, we are supposed to believe we're going to get a higher premium for that risk. So I've, in fact, that's one of my most important rules is to make sure that we are setting ourselves up for a premium return that has the right relationship with risk. And then I love an investment that gives you a higher return without taking more risk. But even better is higher return at less risk. And a lot of people think that Everything is about if you take more risk, you get a higher return. I'm sorry, that doesn't necessarily work. In fact, for people in retirement, it is often the case that the people who take money out of their investments in retirement do better when they have less risk exposure than when they have high risk exposure. So again, that's one of those myths, those things that, that uh, we believe that may not really be true. But I do think that with a look back to history, we can find ways with the help of others. There is not one thing that I'm about to share with you that I made up. This is simply out of the history books. Now, one of the questions, and I can understand why people might be asking this today, is do stocks make more than bonds? What is the history of the belief, not what happened, but the belief of whether stocks make more than bonds? Well, I can tell you right now that over the last 20 plus years, the long-term treasury bond has made a, about a 1% more return per year compounded than the S&P 500 since the beginning of 2000. That compound rate of return is around 6% versus uh, 7% for the long-term government bond. So back in 1924, a book came out written by uh, Edgar Lawrence Smith. It was the first book that was written that the, that the public was exposed to. They discovered that, according to Dr. Smith, that common stocks had a better rate of return than bonds. At that point, that was not common knowledge. And so that was very attractive to people, particularly because the market was going up. Unfortunately, as so often happens, about the time that we find out what the good deal is, it's a good deal that somebody else got rather than us. And in a sense, that did happen to a lot of people. 
because about the time his book comes out and it becomes popular and people are, are, are buying equities, stocks and companies, uh, about that time, the market took a nosedive, which of course uh, was part of the, of the depression. But what we do know today, that bonds are certainly less risky than stocks in the short term. And if that simple piece of information isn't obvious to a young person, somebody needs to make that obvious because they may be saving for a short-term need, not a long-term need. And so for the short-term need, and this could be a parent, this could be a parent saving for a child's education, and the child is 17, about to start at the university, and the money's going to be needed, but they have a lot of the portfolio and stocks, money that they're going to need in the coming years. Most professionals would say, that if you need money over the next five years, it shouldn't be at risk. Now, in my case, my wife and myself, we have half our money in bonds and half our money in stocks. Now, we use mutual funds, we use index funds, we'll talk about those a little bit. But the fact is, that half of the money being in bonds and what we do every year, the first week of the year, we take out 5% of our investments that are, are there for our retirement. So we, in essence, have 10 years of, of low risk investments to take care of us. And, and that's maybe a little over the top, but I'm 76, my wife is proudly younger, but the fact is, we should not be all equities at our age, at least that's what we believe. But when we look at stocks over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, it turns out that, that whether you look at inflation or, or without inflation, that in some ways stocks are actually a lot less risky than bonds. Partly because after inflation and taxes, there's almost no profit left in bonds. And also those risks that we worry about are short-term risks. Risks, they're not long-term risks, they're short-term risks that keep us from sleeping. But we own them for the long term. And there, at least historically, that hasn't been as risky. I don't want to say no risk, but bonds do have risks as well. In fact, let's look at bonds for just a second so we can, we can get this in perspective. And this is particularly important, I think, to, to young people who are putting money aside for the long term. And about 30% of millennials who are investing for retirement refuse to go into the stock market because they know maybe about 2000 through 2002. And if that wasn't bad enough, there was 2007 through 2009. And yes, the market has been going up up until this recent bear market, which has, has not even been a, an average bear market. It was, it was uh, done and over for the S&P 500 fairly quickly. But look at bonds. Here we have bonds going back 92 years. Short-term bonds, intermediate-term bonds, long-term bonds, all government bonds. And what we see is the compound rate of return for the short-term government bond is 3.3, 5.5 for intermediate, 5.6 for long-term. And the long-term is more risky. So it turned out that for be being willing to have a year you lost 15%, you got about a half a percent better than the 5% loss that was suffered, the worst loss for the intermediates and basically a break even for the short term was the worst 12 month experience. So there does seem to be this relationship between risk and reward with the bonds. And you can see why when you find out that the inflation rate over this 92 years was 3%. If you were investing in an attempt to grow your money after you paid taxes, if you did on the 3.3, and then you reduced the buying power of your money by 3%, you're, you're actually 
you're actually going backwards. How about the equities, the stocks? And I'm never talking one stock at a time. One stock at a time is, is about magic. Uh, well, actually, it isn't about magic. Uh, there's a site that I highly recommend to, to uh, parents or grandparents that would like to help their kids become more financially literate. And I just noticed their question of the day that they send out to teachers and people like me or people like you, if you ask, but the question of the day was about the return of Netflix over the last 10 years. Turns out it's been a 47% compound rate of return over the last 10 years. And it's not even the same company. It's a fascinating thing to teach young people how some companies are able to adjust and take advantage of the future and others are not. And, uh, and so it, it, it is an interesting story about a name brand that young people know. The problem is we only both know about the Netflix after they've made all that money. I mean, we can say Amazon's a great place to put money, but there were people who paid $100 a share for it who then saw it go down to somewhere between 10 and 20 before it took off to the moon. But what we do know is this, if you owned all of the S&P 500 stocks, what they call large cap blend, a blend of value and growth, growth being popular, value being really out of favor, not the popular companies. But what we know is, is that over the last 92 years, instead of a 3.3% gain or a 5.1 or a 5.6, it's been 9.9 .9, and $100 grew to $602,000. As opposed uh, uh, to uh, something less than that here, 2,000 for short-term government, 10,000 for intermediate, and 15,000 for long-term. In the long-term, equities are better. That was first discovered by the public just before a huge bear market. And then for decades, they didn't trust the market. A dec a decades that huge profits were made by investors, but it was hard to overcome the pain from what they thought was supposed to be a gain. But if we look over longer periods of time, and just very briefly, if you look over 15 year periods, it's still basically a break even for the worst 15 years, but there was a 15 year period that short term bonds made 8.3. By the way, that was not a big deal because inflation over that period of time was about the same or more. And if you were in intermediates, it was 11.3, same story. It happened during a period of high inflation and for the long term government bond 13.5. But there were no catastrophic events. When you look at equities, even when you go out 15 years, well, look at here, you had about the same break even. So if you go through all the 15 year periods, we can see with the S&P 500 that you made as much as you would have made. Yes, at more daily volatility, more quarterly, more yearly, more five years. Yes, more volatility, but the difference was, was huge. And the average was 10.7%. And then when we go out to 40 years, now we're talking about, um, I'll call it a lifetime. Actually, if people do what I suggest they do and put money aside for a newborn child, you're talking about the ability of that money to last not for 40 years, not for 80 years, but potentially for 100 years. So you can imagine what these numbers can grow to over a long period of time, particularly if the money is put in the right place, which of course we know what it should have been, but now we've got to guess for the future. But I do know this, I would not put that long-term money over 40 years 
in a bond, except to the extent, as I am right now at age 76, I have bonds to protect my money against the loss in the stock market. It's not about the interest that comes from the bonds. It's about the, low st the, the high stability. And when we look at equities over 40 years, looking at the S&P 500, the best 40 years was 12.5. The worst was not a negative, was not a break even. The worst was 8.9. And by the way, the difference in these two terms, two returns, was less than one half of 1% once you adjust for inflation. This was during a higher inflationary period. This was during a lower inflationary period. Inflation is a very important part of understanding our returns. So we go uh, from wh what happened uh, back in the 20s, and I'm going to fast forward now to the early 90s. Because once again, we learned something we did not know before. And the reason that I know we didn't know it is because when I was a stockbroker for three years, uh, from 66 to 69, early 69, late 66, uh, what, what I learned, I read lots of books. I, I read everything I could get my hands on that I had time to read while I was taking all the, the courses to become a stockbroker. And in all that reading, nobody ever talked about small cap value, large cap value, small cap blend, large, small cap value, et cetera. These asset classes, these different than what they would call uh, mutual funds that are aggressive growth funds. Uh, uh, um, there were that were called equity funds didn't say what kind of equity, they were just all equity. Then there was growth in equity, which means it was a combination of stocks and some sort of fixed income instrument. In fact, it could be stocks that paid a dividend or it might be some stocks that paid a dividend and some bonds. They weren't well-defined asset classes. They were almost like something you'd use for a sales pitch that would meet the needs of investors who knew very, very little. So what happened was we had a chance to now, I think, choose to believe Wall Street, not my, not my first choice. I don't mean that they're all crooks. What I do, I'm sensitive about for investors is so often the things they want you to do are really almost more in their best interest than yours. So the, the only advice that I want to give is something that is going to benefit you and your children, or in some cases, you and your parents, and not because it's not about me. It is totally about you. But we have this choice when we turn to others for, for, for guidance. Do we go to Wall Street? Do we go to Main Street? Main Street is your brother, is there somebody at the office, it's a friend in the neighborhood who you may perceive has a lot of knowledge about investing. And I don't, could be, it could be. But I also know that very often, the things we hear about in casual conversation are not indicative of the whole portfolio. Did they tell you about the things that didn't work out? Did they tell you that this stock they're talking about that made them so much money was just a teeny tiny part of their portfolio. I mean, I own Google. I own Microsoft. I own Netflix. But I also have a portfolio of over 12,000 stocks in the index funds that are in our portfolio. And so you don't necessarily get the whole story. And I'm not sure that a lot of Main Street understands the risk of investing. So from my viewpoint, where I want to turn is to the academic community. And out of the academic community came Eugene Fama and Kenneth French. Eugene Fama, since they came out with their three-factor model in 1992, uh, Fama has uh, 
uh, become a Nobel laureate and, and very famous for his work. Now, it's very simple. The calculations behind it, the studies behind it are massive. But the bottom line lesson that we learn from their work is kind of like was a surprise when Smith's book said that stocks make more than bonds. And what Eugene and Kenneth found out was there were three things that drive over 90% of the return you make in the equities market. And those things are the market equities, the size of the companies in the portfolio, and how much value orientation. Are the, are the, are the companies more growth oriented or more, more value oriented or somewhere in between? And they showed tons and tons of evidence that concluded that in fact, small beats large and value beats growth. Now, if that is true, and if what is most attractive to me are the very large growth companies, should I be reconsidering how I build my portfolio? And that's a question each one of us have to face if we want to look at what we've been taught uh, from the history of investing. So small companies briefly. We know from looking backwards, looking at the returns of all, all, of the small companies. And these are companies that are two to three billion dollars in, in size. And how you determine that size is you multiply the number of shares times the market price on the stock market. And as a group, I said, not individually. First of all, num individually, these small companies are very risky compared to the very large companies. In fact, many of them are going to fail. And we know from history, many of them did fail. And even with the failure of some, the return was still very good. And what the academics will tell us is if you're going to invest in small companies, do not do these one at a time. You should be as massively diversified as you can be. And I'll, of course, tell you how I think you should consider doing that. Same questions with value. Do value companies make more money? Well, they have historically. In fact, you'll see the additional return in just a few minutes based on all value, just as we talk about all small cap. And we need to also understand that whether it's small or value, they don't necessarily go up and down at the same time as, uh, uh, as the large companies or the growth companies. In fact, if you go to the library and you check out uh, uh, one of my books that was, I think, written in 2005 or 2008, it's um, a Live It Up Without Outliving Your Money. There are some pages of, of, of some bar charts that break the market down into deciles so that each bar chart has, represents a period of time and it represents the returns during that period of time for 10 different size companies. And it is amazing. Over one period, little companies, bad. Big companies, great. And in between, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger, the bigger they become, the better they are. It will not shock you to find out over the next period of time, the little companies are great and the big companies as a group are terrible. And this is one of the advantages of having these things that don't go up and down together in a portfolio because from time to time, you rebalance the portfolio back to where you started. And this premium for this asset class, it's not every company. In fact, the academics will tell you 
at the end of five years. Remember those crummy companies, those out of favor companies that we said would as a group do better than the good companies? Turned out they did do better than the good companies, half of them. The other half were still in the doghouse, but it was the half that blossomed that made that asset class more profitable. And it's not something that happens all the time. Anybody who's been following the growth versus value, large versus small, know that you're going to know that in the last 10 years, you were better in large and you were better in growth. Yeah, that's the way it works. Now, as we are prone to do, because we're biased to what's happened recently, it's called recency bias. We think that what has happened recently is more important than what happened before that. Well, it turns out that's not the way statistics actually work. You look at a very long period of time, and what you will see is, in fact, I'm going to show you some of those in the four color presentation in just a few minutes. But I do want to show you the difference of being able to access these other asset classes that the academics brought to us. It was not Wall Street that brought this to us. It was the academic community. So here's the S&P 500, 9.9% since 1928. Large cap value, 11.1. Now, I know that doesn't look like a really big deal, uh, but it turns out, particularly for, well, both for young people and for people who are just entering retirement. In fact, I just wrote an article for Market Watch this week that is about uh, how in retirement, you can, you, you can, I say easily in the past, of course, but you could have a good shot at increasing the value of your retirement returns by over a million dollars. And by being able, this is important, by being able to earn less than a half a percent more. So when I see one asset class that compounds at 9.9 .9 and another that compounds at 11.1, .1, large cap value, out of favor, large companies, and here's another one, small cap blend, smaller companies, around two to three billion dollars, but they're a combination of value and growth, a 12% compound rate of return, and the home run historically has been small cap value because it contains the small premium and the value premium both in one investment. And so the, that premium has been there. Now at 76, I have no idea how much longer my life will be. But I do know this. I do know that it is highly likely that before I die, that I will see large or small beat large uh, for, the, for the rest of my, of my life. Large may beat small and growth may beat value. And the reason I know this is certainly possible is from 1970 through 1999, that the, the, the small cap blend underperformed the large cap blend. And, and, and what, uh, what Dr. Fama answered when somebody asked him, what's going on here? You tell us there's supposed to be a premium for small cap blend. Where's the premium? For the last 30 years, large cap blend has been better. And his response was, you're not very patient, are you? So this is not a claim that if you make changes exactly like the academics would recommend, and I'm suggesting it's worth looking at, it doesn't mean it's going to work. And that doesn't mean it's because, because there is, is, is some major change. From 1970 through, I'm sorry, 1975 through 1999, 
the S&P 500 compounded at over 17%. From 2000 until today, it's under 6%. Well, do you know the difference between how fast money grows at 17 versus six? Well, it, it, it sounds like it's about three times as fast, but it's more. And the reality is that some people were lucky and started saving in 1975. John Bogle was lucky at Vanguard because for the next 25 years, this new mutual fund that people called Bogle's Folly, people laughed at him and said, who will want a mutual fund that will give average returns? And then it makes 17% a year. Made him look like a pretty smart guy. Now, that was over, those returns were over a long period of time. We have the good fortune of having just finished the ninth decade through which we have returns that the academics have created by digging out the returns of every equity in whether it's small cap blend or small cap value, large cap value, S&P 500. There wasn't an S&P 500 in 1930. There, were, there was an S&P something, but it wasn't until 1957 that there was actually an S&P 500. So another lesson from the past is just because somebody says that something made the money, under, uh, understand it, it, it is hypothetical. In fact, the reality is every return from the past, whether it was created in a lab or it was created in the stock stock market real time is hypothetical because it is never going to happen like that again. Okay, what do we learn from all of these decades from 1930 through 39 here until 2010 to 2019? Well, I see a little history here in the 2030 to uh, 1930 to uh, 1939 that the S&P 500 for 10 years during the period, I thought they lost more than this. But if you survived it and you stayed the course, then you made with a lump sum investment that you made at the beginning of 1930, you basically almost broke even. You lost one-tenth of 1%. One and I've been chastised for decades for telling people, in order to really understand the risk in the market, you need to go back as far as you can where you have enough statistics that you can have a sense that you can make some conclusions about what you're likely to see. And they would say, ah, we're never going to go back to the Depression. That's a whole different time. We have the Fed now. We have all these reasons we can control stuff. And here's what happened in 2000 through 2009. The S&P was the worst performing of the four major equity asset classes, large blend, small blend, large value, small value, and short-term governments and long-term governments. The, the worst, the S&P 500, instead of losing one-tenth of 1%, one lost nine-tenths of 1%. It was a worse 10 years than those poor people had to face back in the 30s. But what I do notice, and I should it notice, and it would likely be, is that long-term government bonds were the place to be in the 30s. T-bills were the third best place to be. But somehow, and I have no idea why, because things happen totally unexpectedly, even for large masses of companies, the compound rate of return of small companies was a gain of 2.3% a year. Better than the S&P 500, but the worst thing to be in during that 10 years was value, whether it was small cap value or large cap value. Now, it's important to understand why we would expect them to be the worst in the equity arena. And that is because, yes, 
Sorry, real quick. Um, there was just a, a clarifying question on that last point that you had. Do the long-term uh, returns include dividends? Oh, thank you. Yes, the dividends are included. Reinvestment of the dividends. Total return. Absolutely. Um, and that's important because when you look at the return of the index itself, which you may see didn't do well over a period of time, if you include the dividends and reinvest them along the way, it turns out that, that you do a lot better because dividends are an important part of the S&P 500. Um, what, what we know is that these equity asset classes perform generally as expected. So it doesn't surprise me that for 40 through 49 and 50 through 59 and 69 and 79, that small cap value was number one. And it doesn't surprise me that small cap blend is right up there or large cap value. And when small cap value tripped and came in second place, large cap value compounded at 20.6, excuse me, and small cap value compounded at 20.2. I mean, virtually the same. And then during the 90s, technology, big companies. We remember the 90s. The 90s, I don't think there was one bear market in the 90s. Maybe if it was, it was a small, short bear market. And so it was a wonderful period but it was 18.2 and small cap value was 16.5. So, you know, in the ballpark of, I mean, 4% is a big difference. I'm not making light of that, but it was the way it was then. And that's the way it was from 2010 through 2019. By the way, by the way, it didn't surprise people that it was a poor performer in uh, the 20 through 20, the 2000 through 2009 period, because it had had this huge run of 18.2% a year for 10 years. Remember, the expected compound rate of return is half of that. So it reverted to the mean. And by the time you include the great times and the bad times, guess what the return was again? about a 10% compound rate of return. But I want to focus on something else that really gives me a sense of something that a lot of people could do. And it's always going to be about trust. But these four major asset classes uh, are, are, are turned inside out. And we're not talking about buying any of these with individual stocks, unless you were to buy an ETF to, to, to look like one of these asset classes. But I want to focus on this four fund combo here that from 1930 through 2019 didn't do as well as small cap value or small cap blend, because those are the expected to be the two best performing asset classes, but they, the four fund combo did better than the large cap value and the S&P 500. And the reason they did better is because the four fund combo is 25% large cap blend, 25% large cap value, 25% small cap blend, and 25% small cap value. And what do we know about that? We know if we pull all of the other asset classes off of the page and only look at the S&P 500 and ask somebody to think about it, which strategy over time, not one year at a time, which strategy is the least risky? Now, I am not suggesting for a second that you put all of your money in the four fund combo. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody used that strategy for the equity part of their portfolio. But again, uh, I have something, we have something very similar to the four fund combo 
it's the same balance of large and small and value and growth, but it also has international. And it has 10 different funds in it, but it's basically the same with some more diversification and a very slightly higher return, not much. But what I notice on this page that gives me hope, I love the fact that the four fund combo kind of congregate around the middle of the page. Middle is good for me. You see, top of the page probably suggests a lot of risk. And, and I'm okay with some of that, but I don't think I want a lot of it. But down here, here's the S&P 500, last, second from last, third from last, two times. And if we go out 20 years, the four fund combo is better than the S&P 500 every 20 year period. And by the way, it isn't always by just a little bit, 16 versus 14, 10 for four fund, seven for S&P, 18 for four fund, 18 almost for the S&P. And then 2000, 2019, 9.1 for four fund and 6.1 for the S&P. So, I, and, and I mentioned this because this is the kind of work that has come out of our industry after Fama and French did their work. Fama and I French lost did the people. audio. Pardon? Uh, Fama and French were academics studying individual asset classes. People like Paul Merriman and other investment advisors, they were trying to figure out how do you put these asset classes together to minimize exposure to risk and maximize the return. Doesn't mean get the highest return, but for the level of risk that somebody might be comfortable with. So this comes, all of it, basically out of the academic community and is certainly new since uh, I came into the industry in the 60s. And here's something else that is new. And this is just one example. If you went to paulmerriman.com and you, you, you opened up best advice, and then you could see fine tuning tables for the S&P 500 for 10 funds, for four funds, for all sorts of different combinations of US and international. The purpose of these tables, and this too in essence has come combination between the investment advisory industry and the academic community. I can look at 50 years of performance. Here's 20 of the 50. I can look at that four fund combo in combination with 10%, 90% bonds, 80% bonds, 70% bonds. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. I could do it with 90% equity. No, I was right in the first place. I could take, start with 100% in stocks and start adding bonds. And as I add bonds, the volatility goes down and over the long term, so does the return. So an individual investor can actually look, and here's the bottom part, the, the last 20 years, an individual investor can see, okay, what did it mean as you added 10% more equities to the portfolio? Well, if you didn't have any, it was 6.9 in an all bond portfolio. If you added 10%, it went up to 7.6. If you added another 10%, another the compound rate of return went to 8.2 and then 8.8 .8, and then 9.4. And here at 50-50, over that 50 year period, it was a 10% compound rate of return and we can know how much money we would have lost because every one of us should know with the portfolio that, that my wife and I have, we know that we're gonna have a year, probably we're gonna use, lose 25% of the value of our portfolio. It may only happen once, but I can tell you it'll be painful, but that's what we signed on for. We were looking for a certain rate of return or exposure to that risk that we would get a range of returns. I normally tell people to take 
2% off those returns, not 10% for 50-50, but maybe 8% as the assumed rate of return. But to expect the risk, it's likely going to be there. And if you live long enough, you're going to go through it and, and, and experience it. These kinds of tables give do-it-yourself investors the ability to take your analysis of the risk you're taking and the return you might make to a whole new level. Most advisors, remembering that only about 10% of advisors in America are fiduciaries, and most of those fiduciaries know all of this kind of stuff. This is not special to me. It is special to me uh, in that these tables can be used to help people make better decisions. So this is with the four fund combo. You could look at the same table with the S&P 500 and figure out what your likely risk is and that return, and then you can choose. Do I take 2% off or 3%? So then we come down to another important question. I think a huge question. Are more stocks in your portfolio likely to give you a lower return or a higher return? And I can tell you that when I came into the business in the mid-60s, we were taught at the New York Institute of Finance. Yes, I did graduate from the New York Institute of Finance, a sales training school for three months so that when you went back to your respective brokerage firm, you knew how to talk the talk. And once you learn how to talk the talk, people think not only do you understand investing, but for some reason, they give you credit for understanding the future. It's a, one of the reasons I left after three years. Anyway, Dr. Bessembinder, here he is right here. Heinrich Bessembinder, University of Arizona, I believe it is, did a study looking at every stock on the stock market that's been public since 1926. Now, other people had already dug those returns out uh, at the University of Chicago. So that had been done uh, and kept up to date for years. But what Dr. Bessembinder found that was fascinating uh, to people who are looking for the best, the how do you help people do the best you can for them whether they've got an advisor that maybe they need to train the advisor, but if they don't have an advisor, what should they know? Well, it turns out that the more stocks that you own in your portfolio, the return goes up, not down. Some people say, oh, who wants to add average? Who would, who would want to have 12,000 companies? How, you're going to get a lower return if you get the average. No. It turns out Companies like Netflix and Google and General Motors, by the way, a company that is perceived to be now a failure of sorts, having gone through bankruptcy. But for decades, it didn't go through bankruptcy. In fact, people believed as General Motors goes, so goes America. It was a, it was a way of measuring how you thought the market might do. If General Motors did well, so would America and the stock market. So it turned out that one out of 25 stocks, public stocks, 4%, had huge returns. And at least for a while, at least for a while. Remember Sears Roebuck? At least for a while. It was a great stock. 4% made big money. The other 96% on average made 3% a year. 3%. Now, a lot of those companies went bankrupt. Enron, bankrupt. Eastern Airlines, bankrupt. Well, it doesn't mean you can't come out of bankruptcy, of course. 
That's about to happen now probably to a lot of, a lot of companies. They're going to go into bankruptcy. But it is a setback for the value of the company at that point. It has to be figured in to the total return. So it turns out that if basically 96% of the stocks don't do very well, you are probably smarter to own them all than to miss the 4%. And you may think, you may think that it's easy to pick the 4%. They're the ones doing the best. Oh, yeah. Pick those in 1999, if you will. And then by the end of 2000, those stocks, in many cases, out of business. But the, the NASDAQ index tracking those higher risk technology companies was down 80% during that bear market. So this was important news from the academic community. And it makes me feel good. Now, there's actually, there, there is more evidence, and I'll, and I'll show you in a second. But before I do, I want to talk about something that's really interesting. I've read a lot of articles about why or how is the country going to change for what we've just been through? What is it doing to us? What are the implications? For, for me, it means... I don't ever have to travel to the East Coast to make a presentation. I mean, they may like me to go there, but I ain't going. I'm willing to do Zoom forever. And, and, and when I'm done here, ah, I'll likely be having a short nap. That's the way life should be at 76. But the bottom line is, life is going to change. I don't think that my wife and I, and Zan, I don't think we're going to go out and have dinner out as often as we did before. We actually kind of in, enjoyed uh, eating at home and, and uh, having quiet conversation. Anyway, there will be change, I think. And there was change in the mid-70s. It's interesting that two major events happened in the mid-70s. And I think they were likely sparked. I'm, I'm not in, I'm not in, this is intuitively. I haven't seen a study anywhere that says this, but what had happened right before these changes happened was that from 1969 to 1974, the losses inflation adjusted were the same as 29 to 32. There was, a, there was one of those situations where what happened was not new and it upset a lot of people. They really had it in their mind that if they put money in the stock market, that uh, they'd get a certain return. They certainly wouldn't lose most of their money, particularly if they held the investments for what they thought was a long period of time. I've had uh, one client, at least, when I was in the industry, that when things didn't work out and they were down 1% at the end of the first month, they fired me. And, and, and I, I talked to him because I, th I thought it was kind of strange we had talked openly about the kind of losses that she was likely to have. I said, have you forgotten that? Always worried about somebody suing you also for, for something that just isn't fair because we were always very open about the downside. And she said, no, yeah, you told me that. And I said, well, why then did you decide to terminate after a very small loss. And she said, and she was serious, that she thought before she lost, she would make some money so that the losses wouldn't really come out of her money. And she's not crazy. She just has a, 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 a fear, had a fear. I don't know what she has now. Uh, but she did seriously have a fear of losing any of real money. Just like people will tell me when their stock has gone from uh, 80 to 5, like Enron did. Haven't lost money, Paul. I have not lost money. Why? It's worth 5. Haven't sold it. Never lose money unless you sell it. I just don't think that way. And yet a lot of people do. 
So here's what we have. A whole bunch of people who struggled and lived through the 73, 74 bear market, the worst bear market uh, I'm, since the 30s or the 40s. And along came some regulation changes that made it possible for one of the most evil, slimy, distasteful people to be ever in the industry, Charles Schwab. You can just tell by looking at him. He's an evil, evil man. Well, why was he evil? Because before a firm like Schwab started discounting commissions, and before the government, basically there were regulations as to how much you charged when you sold somebody 100 shares of IBM. And for 100 shares, you could be paid, as a, as a broker, $175. It was a high-priced stock, $175. Well, twice that if you sold them 200 shares. Those were regulated commissions. Today, as I think many of you know, you can actually trade stocks with no commission. Talk about deregulation. But Charles Schwab started this, this discount brokerage firm where their job was not to give advice, but to give access to very low cost uh, transactions. And the industry tried to paint him to be something, something very bad. There, there must be mafia money behind that man. I mean, the stories were, were, by the way, when I say they were believable, it's because how could the, how could the industry afford to, if they were normal, to, to discount was well, because they were making so much money that they could afford to discount. And, and now with commissions down to zero, believe it or not, doggone it, they find ways to make money. So that came along and it took a while to catch hold, but obviously it has. And at the same time, John Bogle happened to get fired from his job at Wellington and he was looking for a way to build his, his own approach to investing. And when he was at Princeton, his senior thesis was basically, in a way, about indexing. So he came up with this wild idea of creating a mutual fund with low expenses that the shareholders would actually be the people who owned the company. And that, and, and by the way, the, the, the management fees, the operating ex, operational expense wasn't real low, but as the company grew, they lowered it. And as they grew more, they even lowered it more and, and, until they became a real nuisance to the industry. He was first laughed at I'm sure not behind closed doors in the industry, but at the public level, who would ever want to buy a fund that would give you average returns when Wall Street can give you above average returns? Well, it turns out none of that was true. Oh yeah, a few people would. Peter Lynch did, uh, and some others. Michael Price at Mutual Series, if you happen to know them. But most people didn't, and they eventually found that all out. That all happened right in after that terrible bear market of 73 and 74. And I think these changes, the lower commissions and the lower operating expenses, that sounded good to people who had just lost a lot of money. And uh, particularly when you find out that the people who were charging you these high prices uh, were then able to do just fine at lower prices. So you had a double whammy. You paid 8.5% to get into a mutual fund that then went down 50 or 60 or 70%. And eventually, not only did, did mutual fund load fees come way down, 
but the no load industry exploded. And that was partly the combination of John Bogle and his index fund. And oh, by the way, his index fund was not a no load fund the first year. It was in the second year that it was made into a no load fund. Future. What I see from everything that I know that's happening now, fees somehow will come down more. Uh, we have been in a downtrend on fees, whether it is for private management to take care of individuals or the mutual funds themselves, to the point where Fidelity has some mutual funds that have zero management fee zero operating expense, no minimum, no minimum. Want to open an account with $100? Go ahead. No minimum. Uh, and aha, no commission to buy or sell. What a deal. Uh, can't get much lower than that, but there are a lot of people who are a lot higher than that. I think you're going to see more diversification. I think you're going to see more automation. In fact, the most popular fund in America today is a target date fund. And if you have time, I hope you'll watch my video, Amer uh, Target Date Funds, America's Number One Retirement Investment. Because this is a fund that your child or grandchild when they start working can determine what year they'd like to retire. Now let's say it's, it's 2064. Well, there's a 2060 and there's a 2065 target date fund. So they would probably pick the 2065. They then would have a portfolio managed, not so dissimilar from the way pension trustees who did it right, managed it and that is they know how old their employees are how many years to retirement what they're going to have to be able to fund and so they know that early on lots of equities they know that later on you'll have to increase the fixed income they are not built to be the most profitable they are built to be very efficient and very very low cost so that your child or grandchild could open up a target date fund to retire in 2065. And you would probably pay 15 one hundredths of 1% to have total, this is annually, to have total management adjusting for the life of the child. And then they retire and they go into retirement and they just keep on managing it. Now, there are differences. If I look at the BlackRock product, very fine product, built on index funds, great, low cost, that's good. When they, at my age, they would have me 40% in equities. Vanguard would have me 30% in equities. So, so there are differences. But in terms of of having the individual do it on their own versus having professionals uh, who are doing everything they know to work in their best interest. I, I think it's an amazing investment for probably 95 plus percent of uh, people in 401ks today. And, by, and, and robo advising is basically the same thing, except that's being done uh, for uh, the individual. Uh, rather than going through a 401k plan. So I, I wanted to highlight this presentation as an upcoming event because I don't want you to forget that this presentation will be archived by next week. And that if you know somebody who you think might benefit from this, uh, then they'll be able to come uh, to uh, Bainbridge Community Foundation and, and watch this. Uh, I will be doing a piece next week on the 10th, same time, 
about how to invest in a bear market. Now, it's not only a bear market, but a lot of people are concerned about what do you do when markets are so volatile? And, uh, and, and I'm going to be talking about what I consider to be the, the three best ways to take money out of your investments uh, in retirement. This is my website. If you're really serious about the work that we do, you go to Best Advice, open it up, and all of the most important work that we do to help people. Uh, again, we are not advisors. We are simply teachers. And then there are some free eBooks. The best free eBook is about to come out. It is about $12 million investment decisions guaranteed to change your financial future. That's the first half of the book. The last half of the book is called Two Funds for Life. And that's about how to combine a target date fund with a second fund to improve the performance over time. It will not shock you that that second fund is likely to have value in it. And that is free. If you sign up for our our free monthly, twice monthly newsletter, then it will automatically be sent to you. And you can take that and automatically send it on to your kids. We are just trying to get this information into the hands of people who either themselves want to improve their financial future or they want to help others. 